A very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Institute of South Asian Studies panel discussion on COVID-19 and its economic impact on Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. The COVID-19's economic impact on various South Asian countries is slowly beginning to unfold. Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, two of the South Asia's major economies with significant presence in global supply chains, are facing multiple challenges from this pandemic. Today's panelists will examine the challenges and future prospects for Bangladesh and Sri Lanka in the light of the current situation. We're delighted to have on the panel of two very special guests from Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, and they are Professor Salim Raihan, Professor, Department of Economics, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, and Executive Director of the South Asian Network on Economic Modeling. And with him, we have Dr. Ganesh Viknaraja, Executive Director and Chair of the Global Economy Program at the Lakshman Kadirgama Institute, Sri Lanka. Welcome to the panel, our special guests. And to start the session, I invite our ISAS director, Professor C. Raja Mohan, to say a few words. Professor, please. We have a uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Mithendu Palit, uh, to moderate the discussion and to take this forward. Uh, ISAS in the last few months and in the days ahead uh, plans to uh, devote uh, much attention to uh, what the impact of the COVID crisis uh, on the region, uh, on all the major countries, and the consequences of that for the people uh, of the subcontinent. Uh, so uh, I will stop here and I'll invite Amitya Indu to take this forward. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rajamohan Mohan uh, for, and uh, my colleague Sitara for those initial remarks and setting the stage for this very significant event that we are having today on discussing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Before we proceed, I have a couple of requests, essentially in the order of uh, housekeeping rules, which have become uh, completely salient in the Zoom type environment that we survive in today. I would uh, request everybody to keep their microphones kindly muted while a particular speaker is speaking. And I would also request uh, to, to the level of your Wi-Fi signal that you have around you, if you think you can keep your video screens on, please do those. Otherwise, you are most welcome to stop the video as well. Uh, myself, Dr. Vignaraja and Professor Rehan, we will have our videos and audios on. But while one of us is speaking, the other two will keep their audios muted to reduce the echo that is coming out of the conversation. So with those and a final uh, request that you can always put out your questions, comments, queries that you have on the chat board that you'd see right at the bottom of your screen. I'm afraid we may not be able to accommodate all the questions that are raised uh, in the meeting today because we have a very large group of uh, participants who are with us today. But uh, we will try to uh, discuss as much of the important questions that we can with you. I will exercise my uh, prerogative of the moderator to kind of draw up a picking order and try to distribute as much as uh, between the uh, two distinguished panelists that we have. So let me start uh, with a little bit of background on uh, why we came to this subject today. Now, uh, it's been more than four months uh, that we have been experiencing the outbreak of the COVID-19. South Asia was a relatively late entrant uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. It began uh, much more intensely in East Asia and Southeast Asia spread on to Europe, but then subsequently, as it turned back into the Middle East and the Gulf, it started getting in closer to the South Asian region. And today, of course, you have the largest economy in uh, South Asia, uh, India, which has nearly 80,000 confirmed cases, followed by uh, the two other big economies of the region, Pakistan and Bangladesh. 
Now, uh, in terms of the impact of the COVID-19 on the region, what we are essentially looking to uh, diagnose today is how will the two major economies of the South Asian region, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, be impacted by the outbreak of the pandemic. Now, why do we come to this question? We come to this because that there are certain analysis primarily in the nature of forecasts, which have already been uh, shared with the global community and the regional community, which point to the fact that South Asia is actually headed into a fairly bleak and distant economic future. I'll quote some numbers here that have come out of studies that have been done by the World Bank. The World Bank's latest uh, forecast for the region, which were released in the month of April, point to this region as a whole coming down to a growth rate of around 1.8% to 2.8% in the current financial year. Now, with respect to the rest of the world, when there is a lot of talk going on about countries dropping deep into recession and experiencing negative rates of GDP growth, this might still sound good, but let's not forget the fact that 1.8% to 2.8% rate of growth for South Asia is actually going to be its worst performance since 1980, if the lower end of this forecast works out. In 1991, which was the year when India experienced its by now historic balance of payments external sector crisis, the region suffered a growth rate of just under 2%. But it is highly possible that if the effect of the pandemic goes deep, then the region in the current year might actually come down to a level of growth, which has been the worst in the last four decades. And what is driving this situation or this downward trajectory of economic growth? There are essentially three main factors, and we will talk more about this with respect to Bangladesh and Sri Lanka specifically. But the three main factors that we get to see are first, number one, there is going to be a severe decline in demand for exports from the region. And this is where uh, both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka become significant in terms of the roles that they have in so far as the contribution of exports to the economy is concerned. There's going to be a severe decline in external demand, primarily because consumption and demand in the main markets of these economies are going to suffer, which is primarily in North America and Europe. The second important factor that is going to impact the economic prospects of the region is there's going to be a significant decline in the tourism prospects and earning from tourism. Now, it may not directly in a very significant fashion impact the relatively bigger economies like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or even uh, Sri Lanka to some extent. The impact is singularly more for the relatively smaller economies like Nepal and Maldives. But again, we cannot lose sight of the fact that travel and tourism is an industry which has been badly hit by the COVID-19. And at the same time, it is also an industry which generates substantial amount of employment. So the question of livelihoods becomes critical in the question of the prospects of the travel and tourism industry. And the final point is the fact that South Asia depends significantly upon inward remittances that come into the region. South Asia continues to be a region from where people move out to jobs. A lot of them go to the neighboring Gulf and Middle Eastern countries. And because of the situation that we encounter right now, there is a backward migration that is happening in terms of people coming back to their respective countries, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, and Pakistan. And along with them, the flow of remittances is going to travel. Now, we're going to go look at these factors individually, specifically with respect to Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. But let me now turn to the situation in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And I would very briefly just allude to a few numbers in terms of what's going on in the two countries because before I request my distinguished panelists to express their views. As of today, and I'm uh, giving the numbers which have been reflected in the World Health Organization situation reports. So this might just come in with a 
24 hour to 48 hour lag. As of today, the total number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 in South Asia, eight countries taken together, is just under 140,000. So this is 138593 as of today, out of which around 60% of the confirmed cases are attributed to by India, which is just a little more than 78,000. And obviously, India uh, has the largest number of deaths arising from the COVID-19. India is followed by Pakistan, which has more than 35,000 cases with around 27% of the share of confirmed cases. The third is Bangladesh, a little more than, uh, no, it's almost 18,000 cases that we have right now, which is accounting for 12% of the total cases for the region. Sri Lanka, in contrast, has less than 1,000 cases, according to the numbers that we have with us right now from the WHO, which is less than 1% of the total number of confirmed cases in the region. So between Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, there is clearly a difference in terms of the incidence of the COVID-19 and the people who have been affected. But this should not lose sight of the fact that Bangladesh is a far more populous country than Sri Lanka, with its population of around 165 million people at this point in time, and Sri Lanka with a population of just around 22 million. Now, from this scenario, if we look a little beyond in terms of the effects that has been happening and the countries that have been uh, involved in the process trying to contain both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka like their neighbors, have gone on to what is now popularly described as lockdown strategies, restricting economic operations, bringing in social distancing. But we have all seen across the world the dilemma between lives and livelihoods, which is gradually pushing countries uh, to a direction where they can normalize their economic activities. Now, with that very brief background, let me now turn to uh, first uh, Professor Salim Raihan. Salim, uh, may I request you to kindly highlight what you think are the main issues with respect to Bangladesh in terms of how the COVID-19 has impacted the country? What has been the Bangladesh strategy in handling it? And what do you visualize as the main economic impacts? So if you could devote the next seven to eight minutes to addressing these issues, please. Salim. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, uh, and I must thank ISS uh, for this uh, uh, excellent initiative. And uh, I think I, it's a privilege to uh, speak in front of this, uh, uh, you know, distinguished panel, and also in front of these uh, participants. Uh, very rightly, you said, uh, Dr. Amrinder Palit, that uh, the kind of channels you mentioned, uh, and mostly uh, you mentioned three channels: export, tourism, and remittances. And out of these three, two are very important for Bangladesh, especially export and remittance, there is no doubt. Uh, we actually, uh, uh, if we do some kind of long run estimates of the growth drivers of growth, we find that uh, in Bangladesh around uh, a two third of the growth we can explain by the growth in export and growth in remittances. So that means these two drivers are very important. And uh, these two drivers have been badly affected. The very recent data shows that uh, in April, the export declined by around uh, 84 to 85% uh, compared to last year's uh, number, and which is the uh, lowest in the last 40 years history of Bangladesh. So I think, as you can understand, that this is something, uh, what, how things are happening in Bangladesh. Uh, I should not also forget about the other sectors, especially uh, which the domestic uh, industries, uh, which may not be export-oriented, but there is a huge small and medium enterprises and also different service sectors, uh, which are linked to definitely different kinds of uh, export and uh, remittance related activities, but they're also badly affected. So uh, you, you spoke about the growth rate. Uh, uh, growth rate is very, you know, the projection of what World Bank made. Yesterday, I was actually uh, talking to uh, some of my friends in India. They were saying that some of the estimates which are coming up now, not from the World Bank, but from other organizations, the picture is getting more and more, uh, you know, uh, you know, words. I think getting worse, especially even it's being uh, said that uh, Indian growth rate can go below 
zero uh, percent. And similarly, I can draw the similar line of conclusion for Bangladesh as well. Uh, that if the crisis deepens, we will see that uh, the growth rate will fall uh, further and it will uh, have serious implication for uh, our social and economic development. I just want to highlight a few issues. I think uh, what is the crisis, the nature of the crisis, and uh, the, it has the health component, it has got the economic component. We are very much aware of this, so I'm not really getting into that. But what I really want, uh, want to highlight few issues, especially with respect to the vulnerability of Bangladesh, and I think this is the message what I'll try to deliver, which should be common for other South Asian countries too. So especially the kind of vulnerability to handle this crisis. I would like to highlight the issue of, uh, highlight the case that this region hosts the highest, uh, the largest number of poor people. Uh, South Asia, we know in the world, and Bangladesh, uh, the latest estimates uh, of the official estimates suggest that in 2019, the poverty rate was around 20%. But our estimates from SANEM, we did some uh, simulation exercises using the large scale household data. And we found that if the crisis and the kind of so called lockdown situation holds for three months, the poverty rate can go up as high as to 41%. That means it can be more than doubled. And uh, that means what Bangladesh achieved over the last one and a half decades in terms of reduction in poverty, uh, that achievement can just be lost in, in, the, in, in three months period. So that is the kind of gravity of the situation I just want to highlight. Uh, I think uh, other South Asian countries also uh, having similar kind of problems. Maybe some, when the economic activities come back to the normalcy, uh, not all of these people who have fallen below poverty line, they will be there for, there for long. Some of them will be able to come out of the poverty. But my uh, hunch is that looking into the, this very designated the data, that there will be a significant part of the uh, people who will, for them, it will be a kind of long-term experience of poverty. There is a vulnerability I can see from the labor market as well. More than 85% actually in the informal sector, but which is very much in contrast to, I think, Sri Lankan experience. I think Sri Lankan in uh, labor market around 60 to 65% is uh, informal. So I think as Dr. Palit, you mentioned, the like difference between Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, uh, the impact will also would emerge, uh, how do you see the labor market? Uh, I think for Bangladesh, another uh, vulnerability comes from the health expenditure. It's a very poor public health expenditure, which is around 0.5% to 0.6% of GDP. And it has been there over the last two decades. So I think with this very low health, public health expenditure, uh, this is extremely difficult to handle this kind of crisis situation. Uh, I, I shouldn't, we should not forget about the poor quality of institution, uh, especially uh, the kind of uh, institution we are seeing now the quality in handling these uh, health-related challenges, as well as in handling different stimulus package, which has been announced now, which is around 3.3% of GDP. And you need a kind of uh, better institutional framework to handle this big uh, uh, stimulus package. I am fearing that uh, because of the food insecurity situation in Bangladesh, you know that if you look at the global hung hunger index, which is uh, developed by uh, IFPRI, uh, this region actually has a very high degree of uh, hunger, uh, if you look at the hunger index. And uh, this kind of uh, food insecurity can have a very, very long-term impact. So I think we need to look into this issue as well. And my final point of vulnerability comes from the economic structure. Uh, especially the country is heavily dependent on, as I said, on ready-made garments, as well as remittance. So if you are heavily dependent on certain sectors, that means uh, you are actually vulnerable to these uh, areas. So now coming back to uh, your point uh, that the how, what, was the, what has been the kind of response uh, uh, you know, uh, from the government, especially we, uh, when the crisis had the onset. So the response was from two, that there are, I can uh, categorize two kinds of response. I think these are very common. First was imposing so-called lockdown and then second was announcing different kinds of stimulus package. In Bangladesh, uh, unfortunately, it was not uh, termed as lockdown. It was termed as a public holiday. I think the messaging was not very clear. You know, the kind of message you give to the people uh, that uh, it's a public holiday. So you can't really enforce the kind of lockdown you, you, you really want to do. 
And here I also see the kind of gap in uh, our ideas uh, that in a country like us, and where institutions are very poor, enforcement is very poor. I'm not really, I think there is a, a contrast uh, between Bangladesh and Sri Lanka where Sri Lanka declared curfew and they were probably in a better position to impose it or enforce it, but Bangladesh was not. So for Bangladesh, the choice between life and livelihood after a certain time, we found that uh, you know the government started opening it up and when the cases of, the, of affected people, also the number got increased. So I think this is something we need to understand that you know, in a country like us, how do you really enforce a lockdown situation? And I think we are getting into a situation where uh, because of the priority on the livelihood, uh, if you give a, a make a very unplanned opening up, then the pressure on life would uh, be there, more pressure, and that will create more pressure on the livelihood as well. So I think this is a kind of dilemma or kind of a trap, an equilibrium trap, which we are seeing now. Now the second point, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief here, uh, that is on the stimulus package, what the government has announced. And the government uh, initially started with the ready-made garments, the stimulus package, because very rightly, the reason is, uh, this is the most important sector in our economy. And then government moved on, announcing stimulus package for agriculture, for SMEs, for different other affected domestic industries. Uh, but from the very beginning, we have been highlighting, uh, from Sun especially, that there are three important areas we need to look at for a successful implementation of the stimulus package. In a country for, uh, of you know, Bangladesh, where the tax GDP ratio is less than 9%, and you can understand the fiscal space is very small, and where you are announcing a stimulus package of around 3.3 or 3.5% of GDP, it's a huge pressure on financing. I think that's the first point is, how do you finance this huge amount? So government is relying on the banking sector. Already the banking sector is, we know that in the Bangladesh uh, economy, the banking sector is uh, under serious pressure for, uh, because of high non-performing loan. The stimulus package financing uh, issue is a big issue. There are options, there are kind of prescriptions of printing money or you know, uh, uh, suggesting uh, government to go for loans from the World Bank or IMF. But I think you know, that's a big concern for all, most of the South Asian countries. How do you really finance? Second one, it is very much linked to the political economy and institutional issue. How do you manage it? Uh, so far, I think this, uh, this remains a big question in a country like Bangladesh, where the institutions are very weak, uh, the bureaucracy and the whole system have uh, several leakages. Targeting identification is a big problem especially the, uh, uh, the affected industries and affected people. Government has, has also announced expanding the social protection program, especially yesterday, uh, our prime minister announced uh, giving 2,500 taka to 50 lakh uh, 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 households. Uh, but these are all very noble initiatives, but at the end, you have to execute it. So whole management is very important. And finally, I'll stop here, Dr. Palit that uh, the effectiveness of this stimulus package depends on a proper monitoring mechanism and how do you monitor it? And that monitor should not be only done by the government. It should be a kind of a government, private sector and civil society's initiative, joint initiative. I'll stop here, Dr. Pali, then I'll be very glad to take questions you know, further. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rehan. I think, uh, you know, firstly, very, very illuminating, uh, very focused and crisp reflection on the issues that are influencing Bangladesh right now. I think uh, what I really find remarkable about what you bring out is the fact that uh, there are aspects of the development trajectory uh, for a country like Bangladesh and which largely resonate with the developing world at large, including that of India, in terms of whether countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or even outside, uh, maybe even in Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America, are actually able to afford the containments which they have put in place. And this is largely because of the fact that you alluded to the space for fiscal stimulus, the weak state of the public sector banks, and the fact that at the end of the day, institutional weaknesses remain paramount. So there's always this question of effectiveness, uh, which is going to be suboptimal. And to what extent are the 
efforts of the state going to benefit the people who are really pushed back very hard to the wall. And on that note, let me now uh, invite uh, Dr. Ganeshan Vignaraja to share the experience of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, Ganesh, again, uh, roughly these three main points that we have been uh, looking at. First, uh, the character of the pandemic, that's the way you have seen it shaping in the country. Uh, the effectiveness of the strategy that Sri Lanka has put out so far. And also, how do you see the economic impact panning out? Because this is going to be a long siege and we are going to live with this factor for several months, if not years. Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Isas, and to Amitendu. It's uh, wonderful to be back uh, with you all. Um, I'm going to try to make uh, three kind of broad uh, points. Uh, the first uh, point really is that uh, the public health bit of this crisis uh, has been managed uh, quite well in Sri Lanka. In fact, uh, it's been talked about uh, as a kind of a success case. The uh, United States, in fact, is uh, looking at Sri Lanka for some of the lessons I understand uh, from uh, high level sources in Sri Lanka. And the kind of numbers bear it out. I mean, when you look at uh, the number of COVID cases we've had, uh, Sri Lanka has had 42 COVID cases per million population. And this compares with 72 such cases for South Asia as a whole. And half the thousand or so cases in Sri Lanka, 915 or 16, some number like that, uh, it's uh, essentially from uh, the Navy uh, who were involved in some operations to trace people and uh, they, they got infected. So a large amount of the, the civilian cases are very few and most of our transmission uh, is imported cases and, and there's been very little community transmission. Um, similarly, the mortality rate is very low. Uh, the number of uh, deaths uh, to cases is some uh, 1%, uh, which is pretty low. Uh, by other countries. Now, this um, is explained by, uh, first, uh, we invested a lot, uh, Sri Lanka, over the years in uh, basic needs and uh, the basic sort of nutrition level of the population is, is, is quite good. So immunity is a good thing. Uh, second, we have a, a, a sort of a national health service uh, styled on the British case, uh, which is actually quite good. And there are some 38 infectious diseases hospitals that have been uh, constructed um, and, 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 and also uh, put in, uh, which are being managed by the Thrai forces in Sri Lanka, uh, which have done a very good job in terms of isolating clusters of people. Um, and the contact tracing, uh, which has been done by the military, uh, has also been very, very good. Um, and then don't forget, we're a small country of 22 million compared to Bangladesh, which is uh, very large. So it's potentially easier to do these things in a small country. The lockdown um, has also worked quite well. Um, and, uh, you know, the food distribution has been fairly good. A lot of uh, boom in uh, home delivery, e-commerce. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, there are some cautions, um, uh, particularly the lockdown uh, started easing this week in Colombo and Gampaha, which is the main kind of high risk area that the urban centers. Uh, and, and, you know, people are a bit worried. Uh, we clearly need to do a lot more testing um, there are some 39,000 PCR tests done uh, since uh, February to about now, uh, which is not enough. And there's a call for random testing of the population. Uh, and that might also relieve uh, you know, the, the fact that there may be large, slightly larger numbers than they are. And we need to probably have better communication uh, of things like lockdowns and also the public health strategy. So that's on the health front. Um, on the economic front, uh, the you know, economy will clearly take a hit. And the growth projections for Sri Lanka vary. Um, you have the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, which issued its annual report a few days ago. Uh, they were somewhat uh, optimistic, uh, saying growth this year will be 1.5% this year, uh, positive growth. Um, but the IMF in the Rio 2020, which got issued in April, talks about minus 0.5%. Um, just to give you a sense of perspective, Last year, Sri Lanka grew at 2.3%. Um, and you know, in the worst times during our civil war, uh, we had one or two years with negative growth of either 1.6% or 
or 1.9%. So, you know, these forecasts don't look quite as serious, uh, but I expect kind of flat growth uh, in 2021, uh, sort of a beginning of an L or a long U uh, with probably a slow upturn. And, and, and part of this um, is the uh, international risk. You know, Sri Lanka is a small export-oriented economy. International markets are going to have subdued demand and there's rising protectionism, particularly between major powers. Um, and then there are some also issues of debt overhang in emerging markets as a whole, which are another risk. And there are capital flight from emerging markets generally. Uh, Sri Lanka on the domestic side has uh, you know, risks of limited fiscal room. Um, uh, uh, and we have a debt uh, dynamic issue, which is a problem. Uh, and we have upcoming elections, we think next month. Uh, so there are some domestic risk factors. Now, in terms of the sectors that have taken a hit, um, exports are down. 42% uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, quite a bit of that is garments. Um, foreign investment uh, to about April uh, is something like uh, 370 million, uh, which is probably not going to hold up so well in the rest of the year. We had about a billion or so year. This year will be less than a billion. Um, capital outflows had been large. When the stock market opened, there was a big outflow uh, of, of foreign uh, portfolio investment and the stock market has tumbled uh, and there are clearly new risks to livelihoods and, and poverty. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's some interest in uh, new activities that are emerging. Uh, I mean, one uh, set of new activities, you know, there's a lot of uh, demand for Sri Lankan tea. There's excess demand and we can't, uh, you know, satisfy it. Um, um, so that's one uh, set of issues. Um, a second thing, there's a huge demand for our agri-food products uh, and also our seafood. Uh, very interesting because we, we do do a lot of that. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, garments uh, and chemicals and, and, and rubber uh, firms are switching to PPE products. Um, some of our largest firms uh, are getting this. And part of this is because I understand much of the PPE production that the U.S. takes comes from China. And as you can imagine with the geopolitics of what's going on, uh, there is a clear interest in uh, switching and, and much of our textile exports goes to the US. So we're very familiar with foreign buyers um, and, and there is some switching going on. And eight companies are trying to get US FDA approval, uh, which is a, a big thing uh, for, for PPE products. Um, and then uh, there is also uh, e-commerce that is uh, developing uh, uh, quite rapidly. Um, and we're looking to try to uh, attract FDI. Now, FDI is leaving China, as you probably know, uh, partly in response to uh, the Japanese initiative to try to uh, ensure uh, FDI out of China to Japan and also ASEAN. And then I think this morning or yesterday, the U.S. announced a program uh, where the new U.S. Uh, uh, corporation they've established as part of the Indo-Pacific initiative is also trying to... Um, uh, get FDI to, to move back to the US. So FDI is going to be uh, foot loose um, and we're trying to get some of that. And remember, we have the Hamban Tota industrial zone, which is right next to the port. Uh, and that is a brand new industrial zone, which is trying to provide incentives. And we might uh, tr try to get Chinese uh, manufacturing and other manufacturing investment coming there uh, because it is uh, you know, very convenient uh, and it's right next to the port. Uh, we also have the uh, Colum uh, Colombo Port City coming up, which is uh, basically tripling the office space in the Port of Colombo. So services can also go up. Um, and, uh, you know, international tourism may be there under some controlled circumstances, uh, say with a special zone with China and India. Uh, this is on the assumption that, you know, COVID cases can be uh, managed under some sort of passport scheme with testing of, of such cases. And there's an opportunity for domestic uh, tourism. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not all bad. There is also some new shoots coming up and we have to try to obviously uh, take advantage of these new opportunities uh, while obviously trying to manage, uh, you know, the risks of the sectors that are actually going down. Uh, and, and, you know, some of the traditional ways in which we do things may have to be very different. Uh, last on the economic policy response, um, I think the government made a useful start. Um, you know, we have fiscal and monetary policy stimulus measures. Uh, those are not quite as large as we would like, mainly because of the uh, debt dynamics issue. 
Um, but uh, we, we are trying to deal with that uh, very uh, cautiously. There's discussions with the IMF uh, ongoing and with uh, bilateral donors. Uh, we've had some emergency COVID assistance from China and also from India. Um, we, we are also trying to uh, do controlling of non-essential imports. Uh, government introduced a ban on, on these things and there is an emphasis on some import substitution, particularly in the food sector, uh, which seems essential, particularly if you're trying to improve our food security, uh, which is one of our challenges in a world of scarcity of foreign exchange and buffers being somewhat limited. Um, and then there is some assistance for selected sectors. Uh, and then there's a scheme uh, that the government asks for special bank deposits on a no questions asked basis for Sri Lanka and for abroad to uh, reinvest in Sri Lanka in dollars, but also others to invest and they're giving quite a good interest rate. Um, and then there have been some discussions at a tripartite level between the labor minister, who's also the foreign minister, the business association unions, uh, so that people are kept in work, but at, with reduced salaries. Um, I think it's 50 to 70% at least for the month of April. Um, and, you know, our kind of hope is that Sri Lanka will really be nimble um, and be flexible in the long run. And, and, you know, we have to be thinking of a post-COVID economy. And this really requires, you know, three things, I think. Uh, the first is we've got to try to mitigate the hardship of the people uh, through, you know, uh, food security, and that's linked to domestic agriculture. Um, and then we have to do social protection better. Uh, and that means, you know, uh, going from providing, you know, one-off uh, income support schemes delivered electronically through the banking system, um, right through to means testing for health and education, um, and also uh, reforming the pro poor programs that we have, which may not be targeting the poor. There's this program called the Samurdi. Um, then we've got to stabilize the economy. That, that, that seems very important in a country which has quite a high debt to GDP ratio. Um, and that really means, uh, you know, partly saving for an exchange, but also another IMF uh, program, uh, which I think is inevitable in the Sri Lankan case. But that advantage of that is that it will boost uh, the confidence of capital markets. Most of our debt, by the way, of Sri Lanka uh, is owed to the capital market and not to China. So this debt trap uh, that uh, some people say that we are in is not quite true due to China. Uh, it's partly due to us becoming richer and there being less concession assistance. Um, and that has meant we've gone to the capital market. But that also means you are in the vulnerability of rating agencies and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the foreign uh, lenders and the creditors. Uh, so we've got to try to stabilize the economy that way. And that also inevitably means uh, ins ensuring that our tax base um, is much uh, more stable and we have to look at uh, a wider tax net over time. And then we have to definitely, you know, improve the investment climate in Sri Lanka. We are uh, 99th, I think, on the World Bank Doing Index, which, which says a lot. In my view, we should be uh, down to 60 uh, in that we should be the most competitive economy in South Asia, which we're not. And that means cutting a lot of red tape uh, in many areas. Um, for the field, I think we have to think of a pro-poor uh, structural reform strategy, uh, which deals with a comprehensive solution to many of the long-standing issues in Sri Lanka. And it should be kept in place for many years. Um, some of these ideas um, are part of a, a major study that I have been part of, uh, which is going to be released uh, by the Pathfinder Foundation uh, called A New Economic Vision uh, for a Post-COVID Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, this the report um, has a very comprehensive set of suggestions. Uh, it will be available on the internet. So in conclusion, um, you know, this is an economic crisis like no other for Sri Lanka in our history. But I feel that with a refined strategy, uh, Sri Lanka has a pathway to turn a crisis into an opportunity, uh, you know, and, and regain its kind of position uh, in the economic sphere. Th thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ganesh. In fact, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's ironical that hearing uh, both you and Salim, uh, both of you alluded to one point which in the entire global conversation on COVID-19, uh, I, I, I think has been much less discussed. It's, it's the question of food security. Uh, the greater impact of the world has been on how supply chains can get relocated, how the pharma and the PPEs and the medicine supply chains uh, create asymmetries and how much of self-sufficiency can be handled in that regard. But what you both pointed out to is the fact that for countries in South Asia, 
And of course, now we can draw a parallel with India because India's uh, biggest support in all that has uh, been done so far is on trying to ensure that the vulnerable sections of the population get access to free food. And which I think has been a feature in both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka as well in terms of the price ceilings that have been imposed, the free ration that has been distributed. So I think when we look at the enormity of the COVID-19 with respect to the South Asia region, I think we have to take note of the fact that for this particular region, the biggest vulnerability is connected to the question of deprivation and hunger. That cannot be overlooked. That is serious. And all governments in the region have to look at that point. Ganesh, uh, let me, let me uh, come back to you with a little bit of a uh, context setting on another uh, issue. I wanted to allude to remittances. And you know, when I allude to remittances, I am mindful of the fact that South Asia is the uh, largest region in the world when it comes to receipt of remittances. But when it comes to a country like Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, in terms of absolute volume of remittances that it receives, probably receives much less than what India does, what Pakistan does, what Bangladesh does. But as a share of GDP, uh, it's quite substantial for Sri Lanka. It's more than 8% if, if, I can, uh, uh, if I have the numbers correctly. Now, there's also the character of the remittance that one needs to look at very carefully because by and large, the, the sizable portion of the remittances that come into South Asian economies are from the Gulf. And it is in Gulf where there has been huge displacement of labor. Uh, in India, we have seen millions of returnees coming in. I'm sure the situation is very similar in Pakistan and Bangladesh. But I think uh, there's one uh, you know, part in this whole story which we, as trade economists, we need to allude to. That whenever there have been domestic crises in South Asia, remittances have held up very strongly. Whenever these economies have gone into internal problems, like there have been natural disasters, there have been floods, there have been other occasions, their respective diasporas have really held up and pushed remittances into their respective countries. So the current account of the balance of payments, the receivables have remained firm and strong. But today, we are unlikely to see that happening because the labor itself has come back. The projects they were involved in in the Gulf have either been put on hold or there is no guarantee about when they're going to resume functioning. And finally, the returned labor also adds to the idle domestic labor force in terms of those who are not employed. So Ganesh, I will first like to hear from you. How do you visualize the impact of this aberration in the flow of remittances on the Sri Lankan economy? Um, I think remittance uh, uh, data a bit of a lag. Um, I mean, remittances have historically been important in Sri Lanka. They were probably the third uh, most important uh, foreign exchange earner for Sri Lanka for some time. Um, and, you know, interestingly, there's a big gender dimension. This is the women that go out uh, to the Middle East in particular. Um, low skill, but some semi-skilled. Um, and it's, uh, you know, had a, a very interesting... Uh, emancipation of women in Sri Lanka. Because again, the garment sector in Sri Lanka is, uh, is mostly women uh, or nearly all women. And so uh, there's been an interesting gender dimension. Um, as far as I know, the remittances data are still holding up uh, to some extent. Uh, they haven't gone down quite as much as the other sources have. And uh, through this special deposit scheme, uh, government is trying to get uh, remittances from overseas Sri Lankans. They're, they're giving, by the way, I think uh, 6% on the dollar, on the US dollar. Can you imagine that? You know, no country offers 6%. I mean, then you should now put your dollars in Sri Lanka. And I'll help you sort out a bank account. No, Thanks so, for so bringing I that think up. We're going to get, um, you know, in, inward uh, uh, flows from uh, people. Um, I think as the Middle East downturns, that will be our vulnerability, right? Uh, and, you know, with the oil price down as well, uh, you know, I think in the second uh, half of the year, that is a risk, clearly, right? Um, so, and then also, I think some people are being furloughed, as it were, in the Middle East, and, and some people are being also thrown out of work. 
but being given some time uh, to find a new job, from what I understand uh, the situation of some of our migrants. Uh, so, you know, I think only in the second half of the year will we know. Uh, to, so the short answer is in some extent it's holding up, but, but you know, clearly there'll be an adjustment in the second part of the year. Uh, Salim, if I could come back to you on the, on the, on the question of remittances. You see, I think what uh, Ganesh mentioned is, is actually striking in terms of the fact that, uh, you know, it, it, it's seldom realized how vital the remittances are because the remittances typically have this characteristic of being stable. And also, in, in, on occasions, they are irrespective of the exchange rate risk in terms of the people who are sending them back. They continue to remain very faithful in terms of basically looking at remittances as support to their respective households in the villages, in the communities, and in other places. So again, with respect to Bangladesh, what is the impact that you foresee? Thank you. I think uh, uh, definitely uh, when you have an economy is dependent on remittance quite significantly. For Bangladesh, it's around 6 to 7% of GDP. Uh, there is a kind of year-to-year -year fluctuation, but despite that, it's very important. And also, if you look at the remittance pattern, the kind of uh, the people who send remittance, many of them actually, they, the families depend on this remittance money. And uh, uh, some of our uh, preliminary analysis using the uh, very large scale household data shows that very interestingly, the remittance recipient households may become more vulnerable compared to the non recipient households. The reason I'm saying uh, that uh, the coping strategy of the crisis actually very different uh, between these two groups of households. Uh, because uh, the, the remittance recipient households, if you see their uh, households characteristics, uh, they don't participate much. They are, their participation in the labor market is very different. Uh, you know, the female from the labor remittance recipient households, they don't really participate much in the labor market. As well as, you know, since they're heavily dependent on the external financing, you know, they, their coping strategies to deal with the crisis time is, is not really very uh, well established. So I think this is something which we need to keep in mind that our, some of our analysis shows that a large number of people who are, have become vulnerable during this crisis time, actually they are coming from remittance recipient households. So, uh, and, and that's the point I'd really like to, you know, highlight and uh, to give you the answer that uh, definitely remittance is extremely important for Bangladesh. It has reduced poverty. It has reduced uh, vulnerability. But at the same time, a new scenario which is emerging that uh, these households are becoming vulnerable to this kind of a very a new kind of crisis which uh, we, know we have never seen. It is a double crisis. At the same time, you are seeing people are coming back and also fall in the size of remittance. Salim, if I could uh, steer you on the subject of vulnerability. You know, uh, earlier on during your presentation, you alluded to the fact that there is this uh, very significant risk in the greater labor market outlook, uh, which is a product of the degree of informality. Now, uh, what we see, and this is not just in terms of the anecdotal uh, work that is coming out from the field right now, but also with respect to the kind of work that the ILO has done so far. Uh, it is pointing out to the fact that the sectors which have been hardest hit as a result of COVID kind of across the world are sectors which tend to employ the most of the informal workers. Now, with that correlation in mind, it becomes obvious that countries where informal workers are larger parts of the workforce are going to get that much more affected. So we see that with respect to India. Uh, there are projections of around 400 million workers vulnerable to being pushed deeper into poverty, largely because sectors like number one, garments, food processing, very labor intensive manufacturing have been affected. Hospitality, tourism we alluded to has been uh, affected. Retail trade has been affected. Construction has been affected. Now, on that note, I wanted to check with you uh, what do you see are the prospects for the garments industry in Bangladesh? Because this is actually a question uh, which has been raised by two or three by one of our participants. So essentially, 
uh, we all know that when it comes to the ready-made garments industry, it's, it's the industry for Bangladesh. And if you could allude to that, not just from the point of view of the impact, but also maybe from the point of view of whether you see any restructuring in the character of the supply chains as we go ahead, because that's also going to influence the export prospects. Thank you. No, thank you. I think it's a very, very important question. And I'm, I, I must thank the participants. I think few of them uh, raised this question, uh, especially what has been the response so far uh, with respect to the garment sector the, during this crisis, both from the government and from the government uh, sector itself, as well as whether it is actually having some impact on its competitive position. Uh, my answer is that, the, as I mentioned earlier, that the first response which came from the government uh, in terms of the stimulus package, actually it was for the government sector. And it was for, uh, but it was tacked to actually government sector's workers' wage, uh, not directly giving any kind of uh, you know, a financial benefit for the government's owners, which actually made uh, some of the government's owners annoyed that they wanted some very direct support from the government. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, government tried to make it clear that we want to keep this sector alive by, and also we want to support the workers in this industry. But uh, before getting into the competitive issue, I just want to uh, tell you that actually what is happening in the garments industry. Uh, so definitely from the, when this kind of so-called public holiday or lockdown situation was imposed, all these factories were closed down. And then uh, most of the workers, they actually, because they, they don't uh, come from Dhaka or Narayan Gaji, which is the central part of the city, or, or, or Bangladesh or Gajipur, uh, if you uh, look at this kind of geographical location, they went back to their villages. But then there was a kind of very uncertainty, uh, you know, uh, about when these factories are going to be open up. And uh, there was a very, not very clear message was given from the Bangladesh Garments Manufacturers Exports Association. And that uncertainty actually led the workers to come back to the city and the factories to join the work. And which is, if you remember, I'm not sure whether you have seen in the news media, on 26th April, there's a flood of work, people coming back from the village to uh, this place, Dhaka, Narayan, Gajipur, or Savar, to join the, their work uh, because of the fear that they might lose the job if they don't join. And also uh, there was not a very clear message from the uh, government's uh, the export association that not to come. Or even the law enforcing agencies, they did not have to just stop, they could not stop these people coming back. So I think there was a kind of very unplanned way of handling this issue because that increased the risk of infection, both in Dhaka and, and these places. So that is the kind of, uh, and then again, when the factories uh, were uh, allowed to open up, uh, many garments factories are now open up, though they are saying that they are trying to follow the kind of protocol which have been asked to, uh, you know, asked, uh, they have been asked to follow, but there are serious lapses. Uh, you know, we have seen that, you know, and there are media reports that uh, many factories, they are not in a position to follow this health protocol. So my point is that a large number of uh, workers in the garments factories, they are actually at risk of being further affected. And actually this has been uh, acknowledged by our health minister too. Many of these factories, they are not really running on full, full scale. They are actually running on very kind of, I would say 40% or 50% scale. So in terms of competitiveness, I think uh, uh, this has been a major challenge. There has been a cancellation of orders by the very big brands, though we are hearing at this moment that some of them have assured that probably they will not cancel it finally. But again, as I talked, as I have talked to many of the uh, leading governments uh, people, uh, they have said that there is no guarantee that you know these orders will remain valid. So that means there is a very high chance of export fall or uh, or cancellation of orders uh, in, the, in, in the even in the coming months. So that is going to have serious implications for Bangladesh in terms of competitive position. I just want to uh, give one example and I'll stop here. Uh, when I compare Bangladesh with Vietnam, uh, especially the way Vietnam uh, uh, imposed the lockdown and managed it and then started reopening the economy and then and reopening the garments factories. And just to uh, uh, tell you the reason why I'm saying Vietnam, because Vietnam has become in recent years, the major competitor of Bangladesh after China, you know, uh, in, in terms of, especially with respect to garments. 
So the way Vietnam is handling now, Bangladesh, I think, is lagging far behind Vietnam. So I think this is something we need to keep in mind that for the garments industry in Bangladesh at this moment, it is more of a survival issue rather than you know whether you become competitive or you can actually compete in the future. I think the survival issue has become very, very prominent. I'll stop here. Thank you, Salim. That was uh, very candid, very forthright. And in fact, uh, it's on this particular question of what is affecting exporters. I wanted to come back to Ganesh uh, with a specific illustration of the issues that exporters are encountering, some of which you alluded to, Salim. And it, it, it's a common phenomena by and large across the region in many other parts of the world that when it comes to exporters, the challenge has been that it is not just their orders are getting cancelled, but for the orders which have been dispatched, the payments are not coming in. The payments are not getting realized as a result of which the export finances which they have picked up from the banks are remaining unpaid. So Ganesh, the point that I wanted to bring to your notice is that uh, exporters in a sense have a requirement of working capital which has become very large now and which is not getting fulfilled in terms of the character and capacity of the public sector banks with whom they hold accounts. And going ahead as enterprises, as business entities, as those who are expected to play a very important role in the turnaround of their respective economies, whenever this happens, they are unlikely to get that support from their domestic financial institutions because of the precarious condition of the pile of non-performing loans on which this public sector banks are sitting. So that is why I wanted uh, your views that, what do you think is the way forward? Because in, in South Asia as such, the private capital market or the private financial market is not in a situation to allow the exporters or the small enterprises or the MSMEs to get access to the kind of capital they would require for turning it on. Uh, there is this very unfortunate political competition which has come in when it comes to long-term capital, uh, whether it's going to be a preference for the Chinese capital, for the venture capital space, or there's going to be a reliance on other form of capital. But the bottom line is that if you don't really have FDI flowing in at the pace that you want it to, the reliance of businesses remains high on domestic financial institutions and the domestic sources of finances. Do you think Sri Lanka can respond to this challenge or more effectively the Sri Lankan businesses can? So the work, you know, the point about working capital, yes, there is a bit of a credit crunch coming. And, and what uh, we have done in Sri Lanka is the central bank uh, for some time um, and I serve on the Monetary Policy Consultative Committee, etc. So one sees it fairly closely, has been pushing margins down between, you know, the, the, the prime rate and the rate out lent by the um, banks to firms. And so they're reducing the spread. Okay, so that uh, more pressure is coming in because, uh, you know, there, there is one view that the banks are showing large profits and they're not passing out the change in the spread. So the pass through is low, right? So that's one thing we've been trying to do. And during the crisis, uh, rates are coming down uh, even faster than they have before, the lending rates. So that's the first point. Second uh, points, uh, particularly to business uh, and also to some uh, extent to export. The second point is uh, there's some discussion about uh, credit guarantees um, uh, to, to help uh, meet the credit flow needs of business, working capital and otherwise, um, by uh, guarantees uh, from the central bank, uh, number one, and secondly, uh, linked to multilateral development bank guarantees. Okay. Um, uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, for a small amount of money uh, that's guaranteed by a multilateral bank, uh, this has a multiplier effect on what's available to um, uh, uh, a commercial bank, um, and particularly there's also some support from the uh, central bank. Uh, so the on-lending multiplier can be quite big if the guarantees are in place, right? Uh, the third thing uh, which we are beginning to explore here is exposed credit guarantee uh, uh, schemes. I think uh, import-export bank type arrangements are there in India and other places. 
uh, you know, these types of things are needed in places like Sri Lanka. Uh, and then, you know, some sort of uh, bank letters uh, and some sort of following up of orders. I mean, you see, the problem, of course, is, uh, you know, even the buyers uh, who purchase these things abroad are also being hit. So they naturally are going from a three month turnaround payment period to a much longer periods, right? Um, you know, because of the crisis. So working capital is a problem. Uh, and needs to be addressed by you know different means, uh, and undoubtedly one will see longer uh, payment terms, uh, cancelled orders as well, uh, and there is a need to put in place some guarantee mechanism. So that that I think is perhaps the short answer to your question, and we, we are trying this in Sri Lanka. These things are under consideration. Thanks, Kanisha. In fact, uh, another question which has come up from the participants that we have over here on which I wanted both your and uh, Salim's impression that, you know, uh, in South Asia, uh, this is visible in India. This is also probably visible elsewhere in the regions. Is that uh, the, the response to the lockdown has often run into certain tensions or to put in a milder way, lack of effective communication within the federation in the sense that between the federal government and the provincial governments there has not always been complete unanimity a uh, complete convergence on a common wavelength for implementing the policies for tackling the lockdown now i wanted to hear from you whether you have experienced that in sri lanka and then i wanted to go back to selim on the same question so I mean, the lockdown started around uh, the 20th of, uh, of March, if my memory serves me right, and it continued more or less continuously for, uh, you know, seven weeks, more or less, seven weeks. Uh, now, in parts of the countries that were deemed low risk, uh, there was some relaxation of the lockdown uh, during working hours, so they could move around and purchase things. But in the high, uh, you know, risk areas, Colombo and Gampa in particular, but also Kandy and some of the other cities, uh, the lockdowns have continued. Now, initially, government uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, was fairly clear that this would be till further notice. But then I think the slight communication problem that came in was they kept saying, okay, we're going to relax. And then they didn't, right? Or they kept extending it. Um, so communications uh, perhaps were not as best as one would like. And this, you know, talks about uh, you know, particularly in, in cases where, you know, people can't go out and get food and or money to pay for the online uh, orders that you've got uh, is a problem. So, you know, better communication. And in the Sri Lankan case, why they were a bit uh, up and down on this is because the cases, there was some risk of cases rising, you know, so government naturally reacts in this way. Um, and and so, so I think that's definitely a lesson we have to communicate. We have to have a clear idea of what we locked down and how and then the communication issue, uh, you know, uh, is there. And I guess, uh, you know, in a sense, I don't blame government in Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or anywhere else because, you know, this whole pandemic has been so new, right, in some ways and has strained capacity in so many ways, right? And uh, um, in Sri Lanka, we are somewhat lucky because they allowed a lot of food delivery uh, to come in. So that became a side industry of delivering home. Uh, and then a lot of online payment, you know, my local baker is able to pay online. And, you know, so cash wasn't needed so much for a lot of it, right? Uh, and I think our level of digitization, uh, I think Salim may have a view, but maybe much better than in Bangladesh. It's a much smaller place, right? And, you know, literacy is higher. It's an upper middle income country. So those factors may kick in. Uh, so I think on the whole, you know, there was obviously frustration. People couldn't go out and so on. Now they're allowing people out. Uh, it's interesting. This week, even in Colombo and Gampaha, um, technically people can go out, but according to the digit of your ID card number. It's a bit like your car number plate, right? So they're controlling it. So there's much less traffic and, and so on on the roads. Uh, and then the other interesting effect of the lockdown, which is a, a nice uh, byproduct uh, externality, is that uh, pollution levels in Colombo and elsewhere have fallen significantly. Uh, so there's a whole green side, which I hope we'll talk about on these changes. But, but that's essentially the story. I, I hope you're not getting to see the tigers and foxes on the road as they are visible in some parts of the world. <laughs> not so much here, not so much here. No, thank you, Ganesh. Uh, that's very interesting. But Salim, on that, uh, let me come back to you and uh, try to uh, get your response to 
two aspects which are kind of coordinate. The first is, of course, again, I wanted to visit this question of uh, the coordination within the Federation. Uh, the Bangladesh experience has the federal government been able to uh, be in touch with the, 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 the provincial governments and uh, take a coordinated response. The other question, uh, again, um, in response to what uh, several of our participants have been wanting to know, is that, you know, there could be a way of looking at this whole development as an opportunity. I mean, that's a very optimistic view of how things are and how countries can uh, turn the situation to their advantage. And while we will discuss some details of that uh, over the remaining time that we had, but what I want to know from you is that, do you think in the current context, this gives Bangladesh an opportunity to push towards diversification of its exports as a carefully calibrated strategy? Because with garments having been hit the way they have been, might it be a case for Bangladesh being pushed into exploring other options which under normal conditions uh, the establishment might have been a little reluctant to pursue no thank you uh, now the first question actually bangladesh doesn't have a federal government structure like you, india has or uh, uh, other south asian countries have. Uh, so but there are uh, local governments local governments means kind of uh, local authorities especially sub district uh, you know, they are elected uh, authorities and especially sub-district sub chairmen, uh, uh, what we call in Bangla, Upajala Parishad. So uh, definitely there's there. But uh, one interesting point I just look, I'd like to highlight here that the way uh, the crisis has been managed in Bangladesh so far, uh, and then the way even at different parts of the country, uh, you know, you, you just try to coordinate, it's actually through the bureaucracy. Especially uh, 64 uh, secretaries, they have been assigned to look after 64 districts uh, of Bangladesh. And uh, so there, are, there is a bit of kind of question whether the people's representative or the politicians, whether they have been bypassed or not. Uh, but what I can understand, I'm not really getting into that debate, but what I can understand that the, uh, the reliance on the crisis uh, coping strategy is very much uh, on the bureaucratic, bureaucratic system. And then uh, how effectively they can deliver, it depends on the kind of coordination among these different wings of the bureaucracy. But I can tell you pro, uh, one point that probably uh, at this moment, the local administration is very active uh, at the local level now. Uh, so, uh, you know, that can be an one advantage because they are actually the local administration, they are listing people who are affected to give the cash transfer, or for distribution of food or you know, different kinds of support measures. Even uh, local government became, uh, local administration, I'm not talking about local government, local administration became very active with respect to uh, handling the crisis in the agricultural sector as well. I, so I have seen one question, I just want to link that, my answer to that question, especially in the agricultural sector in Bangladesh, uh, uh, like in India, you see very migrant uh, labor, you know, from different parts of the country, they come and they, uh, go to the paddy field and cut uh, your paddy, you know. So it's a kind of a very regular phenomenon. Every year we see that, from, especially from the northern part of the country. But since during this kind of lockdown situation where people's mobility got stopped, so there was a huge crisis of the shortage of uh, agricultural labor. So then the local administration and the local different kinds of volunteers and uh, of course the political parties, they also got involved and tried to solve this problem. But the problem was solved, uh, especially for the rice sector, paddy, but not for different other agricultural subsectors, especially fisheries or poultry or livestock or even fruits and vegetables. Now we have seen a kind of a devastating effect. So I think there lies, I think, the different issues of coordination and especially to what extent when the bureaucracy already was under pressure, especially with respect to different you know, inefficient were institutional uh, issues, and now you have this crisis. You know, I think this is something, an added pressure for them. But your second question, I think, is very, very important. You know, what do we see, the kind of way forward and something whether positive things can be, can really come out of this crisis? I, I can see that there's an opportunity uh, because uh, 
what i have seen in the past uh, you know my observation is that in the bangladesh over the past two decades especially of the uh, uh, past two decades if i look at that there has been what i have termed is a kind of policy paralysis uh, the elites they were not really very eager to undertake major reforms in critical economic domains if you look at the trade policy if you look at the tax policy if you look at the financial sector reform if you look at the reform for the uh, you know the social sector especially health and education which are very important for your even for your diversification you need skilled workforce you need better human capital for a diversified economy for graduating from garments to you know even to electronics or any other you know high value added sectors so there was a kind of policy paralysis but i can see that now the elites they are forced to come out of their comfort zone to think differently now and uh, there are two sectors i can see that there have it has huge they have huge potentials pharmaceuticals uh, especially i think uh, though they have a very low share in the export basket or bangladesh has been very good in exporting pharmaceutical products to many uh, you know neighboring countries and to african countries taking the advantage of the you know the trips uh, you know you know that the trips bangladesh as an ldc is uh, there is a waiver for bangladesh so i think there is an opportunity for bangladesh to uh, you know uh, emphasize on the diversification effort uh, pharmaceutical in this crisis time is not only pharmaceutical but also medical equipments like ppe or different kinds of uh you know instruments which very interestingly uh, one electronic company in bangladesh they have started producing uh, different medical equipments uh, like you know this uh, different kinds of support uh, medical support mecha uh, support uh, devices uh, and also the it i think there is a high ch high chance and high opportunity how during this crisis time you take the advantage of it but for all of these i think they need to have a supportive policies in uh, in place at the same time uh, elites need to come out of the comfort zone and you know execute these policies properly over to you thank you salim i think you alluded to uh, you know a very fundamental fact of the uh, crisis which has come out and uh, that is the role of digitalization the role of e-commerce the role of it and applied uh, you know forms of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to the extent they can stop the disruptions now what we see is very interesting actually that when the supply chains are being visualized by the controllers of these chains there's an increasing tendency that is coming out in terms of the corporate experiences that these chains are likely to become shorter and perhaps also segmentally more vertical instead of being spread as horizontal as possible they might actually turn to a different direction and what in simple terms that could mean is that instead of sourcing uh, parts and components from 20 vendors across let us say 15 locations it might be a question of localizing them into 10 vendors maybe across four locations just to ensure that the risks become more localized into areas which are more predictable instead of the kind of disruptions that we have noticed. And we have also seen that when it comes to the retail end of the supply chains, those distribution functions which have digitalized, those countries which have been able to handle the e-commerce part of it better, like uh, what Ganesh described with respect to the experience in Sri Lanka, have actually faced much less internal disruption. And uh, this is something on which, Ganesh, I wanted your uh, uh, thoughts. That look, uh, we, we do understand at the end of this crisis, and as you mentioned, this is something which the world has never seen before. Uh, we might not see something like this again. Uh, it's going to be a different world. And in this world, there are certain changes and habits and practices that we have to get accustomed to one of which is probably e-commerce and uh, south asian economies have to really respond to pushing e-commerce as deep within their systems and economic actors and business entrepreneurs as much as possible but having said that how much is the internal preparedness and how much is the realization on this like salim mentioned you really don't have the regulations coming up. You don't have the policies coming up. You don't have the elites which might play a 
constructive role in the making of these policies, getting pushed out of their comfort zones. And most importantly, neither Sri Lanka, nor Bangladesh, nor the whole of South Asia is actually figuring in the global e-commerce stocks which are taking parallel to the WTO and might soon in the near future becoming a part of the WTO. So Ganesh, on this, you have always uh, examined forward-looking issues in terms of the impact that they would have on global and regional trade. What are your thoughts on the specific role of e-commerce, which might have a much bigger role to play in the post-COVID world? So e-commerce, I think, is uh, you know, bound to uh, increase uh, generally across South Asia, um, and it will make transactions uh, so much easier uh, because you will also transcend national borders. So you know, that raises one issue, um, which is about tax, right? How is it that we're going to tax e-commerce transactions properly, right? So do they pay value-added tax uh, in the country of origin or in the country where they're sold to? And you know, these will become uh, important issues. One is tax. A second issue is access. Remember, across South Asia as a whole, um, you know, uh, computers per capita and mobile technology per capita even are not very large. You know, these ratios are very poor and, the, and the, the ratios lag. Now, Sri Lanka has quite a good uh, per capita uh, computer and quite a per capita uh, broadband and, and per capita mobile technology. But I'm sure in a country like Bangladesh or even India, it's hugely variable, right? Uh, and you have big gaps. Um, now, the other issue specifically in Sri Lanka are really two uh, points. One is that our law, um, our IT law, basic IT laws need quite a bit of adaptation. They're very old, um, I've understood. And, and we need to really you know, take into account all the recent developments, the whole 5G story is there. Um, and, uh, you know, the 5G story, uh, you know, are, are our laws ready for this internet of uh, linked things, right? And everything else that comes. And then uh, there is also a, a very sensitive geopolitical issue of, around Huawei, you know, and, and security. And, and the Huawei issue, uh, just very brief comment on that. Uh, I think the only other country that has this capability, which is not exporting quite on that scale, is Korea, right? So they have a 5G system. Now, the problem is there isn't an alternative for countries like Sri Lanka. It's Huawei and 5G or not very much else, okay? And I don't think we have the technical capability to unpick bits of uh, 5G tech. So, you know, I, I think, you know, either the Korean uh, technology has to be taken and, and enabled much greater. Um, so, so I think there are challenging issues going forward. And for Sri Lanka, e-commerce will be more and more important because our basic comparative advantage uh, is shifting out of manufacturing uh, into services, right? Uh, you know, much of our economy services and our services exports are growing. Uh, they're about, uh, I think if I've got my memory right, something like a third to 40% of our exports last year, of course, that's changed, uh, is services, right? Um, and, you know, e-commerce will play an important role is a connector of a lot of that, yeah? Um, and, uh, you know, increasingly, I mean, our, our wage advantage, Bangladesh's wage advantage to us is, I think their wages are 27 cents an hour or something of that magnitude. Our wages are $1.07. So, you know, the, the low-end manufacturing in Sri Lanka is, 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 is difficult, right? Whereas services are going to come uh, in the future. So I think a lot of opportunity, but I don't think it's the big white, uh, you know, panacea for everything. There are a lot of issues on uh, not just uh, the laws, but also connectivity, uh, training and literacy. Uh, you know, the old uh, may not be able to use e-commerce very well. Etc. So there are a lot of issues we have to sort out. Lots of lags. Ganesh, just a quick uh, comment from you on what do you visualize are the prospects for the logistics and shipping industry in Sri Lanka? Do you think there is there is a concern among the authorities over the prospects of that industry? So historically, um, you know, our uh, transshipment trade, in particular, uh, is, is 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 well known because. Uh, two thirds of that goes to India. You know, we have these deep water ports. Colombo port is a big success story um, and has, um, you know, uh, provides a lot. So the big ships come to Sri Lanka, they unload their goods and the smaller ships go to India. That's basically the basis of it because India doesn't have the deep water ports. And India, of course, is realizing that and is invested in this Sagamala initiative to try to do that. Now, COVID obviously, you know, the shipping industry globally is in crisis, right? Uh, I mean, it was in crisis actually before COVID came along. Right. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, rates of uh, container shipping uh, growth rates have fallen since the global financial crisis quite dramatically. That half the growth rates annually um, uh, up to 2018, 2019, uh, COVID has acted as a kind of a structural break, right? Uh, but transshipment in Colombo port has begun uh, because, you know, food is being shipped out and uh, it's coming into other countries. Some parts and components are picking up. Um, what Sri Lanka has tried to do uh, is ensure that the port is COVID free. So our Navy, luckily the Naval base is next to Colombo port, right? In Colombo port virtually. And so they are going around uh, being responsible for biosecurity. Um, and also we are controlling very tightly who comes off ships, including cruise ships and other things. So we're trying to ensure that's a biosecurity zone. So um, you know, to the extent possible, we had an advantage before that will continue because India's Sagamala is not up there yet. Um, I think your Mumbai port is one of your big ones, but the other ports are all shallower than our, the depth of our Kalambu port. And Hambantota is now also coming on stream in a big way. Uh, so uh, I feel our, uh, you know, shipping industry and transshipment will continue for some time after the hit that they will take, uh, because as trade resumes, that will pick up. But that's the whole industry has been slowing. Uh, and I think our biosecurity uh, will, will you know, be an advantage for us. So this will be the new thing, right? Uh, you know, go to the deep water ports. Uh, now, now, within that, of course, uh, price factors will come into play. Uh, you know, our, our price uh, competitiveness is quite good compared to Indian ports. So apart from us having the deep water part, our price uh, competitiveness is pretty good. And our turnaround times, I think, are the best in South Asia, from what I understand. They're, I think they're much, much better than in, in Bangladesh ports. Now, part of that is the fourth terminal uh, in Colombo. We have this CICT terminal, which is a Chinese investment, right? So, so we are getting the best of Shanghai and, you know, all of that in Sri Lanka through uh, this particular CICT tour. And by definition, the other terminals in Colombo have also upgraded, right? Now, with Hambantota coming online, uh, you know, we can increase our tons, which we can carry through our port. Uh, through this irony of Chinese investment. Now that raises a whole lot of other issues that you know, people in South Asia are worried about, national security and other things, but uh, for, for India, uh, but on a pure competitiveness basis, you know, I, if I were a betting person, I'd put money back in our uh, transshipment and our logistics by, by definition also are improving and, and, and uh, I think we have scope. Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, we are reaching the end of our allotted time. Uh, we don't have much. It's been an absolutely fascinating and stimulating discussion. What I would like to end with is that from both of our distinguished panelists, I'd like to check from them that with respect to their uh, own countries, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, we as a world are encountering a bleak scenario. Individually, the scenarios are either bleaker or less bleaker. Not anybody is, I suppose, encountering a bright scenario. But if there are two particular thoughts that you had on your mind as what your respective governments should try to do, looking ahead in the medium term, what might those two be purely in terms of economic policies? What might those two be in terms of your preferred taking orders? Salim, may I start with you? And then I'll come back to you, Ganesh. Two minutes each. Uh, thank you. It was a rapid fire question. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, of course, I think uh, it's very important that we must be forward looking. Uh, you know, uh, otherwise, you know, all we do, the further we an analyze the crisis, we get frustrated. On a very positive note, I think it is very important that the government in Bangladesh, actually we suggested it, uh, we forwarded it to the government that you need to have a recovery plan uh, and a very uh, solid recovery plan, taking into account different scenarios, taking into account of what is the worst possible scenario and what is the best possible scenario. So, and the recovery plan we suggested from Sanim that it should be, it can be a two year recovery plan or three year recovery plan. And the recovery plan should not be very conventional because you need to take very unconventional measures uh, during this time. Uh, just to give you one example, Bangladesh has been uh, maintaining, and it's a kind of macro stability of Bangladesh, which is very good that, you know, uh, four to 5% of budget deficit, you know, of GDP of budget deficit, you know, over the last uh, uh, one and a half decades, which has been excellent. 
But during this uh, recovery plan, we suggested that the government may go for 8 to 10 percent of budget deficit because government has to spend now. So this is my first part, that you need to have a proper recovery program or planning in process. And second thing, I think you need to uh, evaluate, you know, what is your current uh, policies and the loopholes and the kind of gaps you have, because I think that the recovery plan must be linked to, uh, you know, what do you see Bangladesh in the future? You know, so at the point of the export diversification, the point on, you know, you call your policy reforms, because I know that the, many of the reforms are very unpopular. You know, it can actually affect the best interest. But the crisis time, probably the best time when you can actually undertake this very unpopular policy reforms. So I think we should not actually miss out this, this is opportunity. I'll stop here. Thank you, Salim. Ganesh, for your two minutes, two points. Uh, thank you. Um, essentially, uh, you know, we need to take a very pragmatic approach, an opportunistic approach in Sri Lanka and then be non-ideological. I think that's one kind of big uh, point I'd like to make. And there are really a three-step uh, program. I mean, we've got to ensure, uh, you know, uh, the livelihoods of the people are protected and there's food security. Without that, you know, the, the role of the state uh, is, is a question mark. And I think we've got to try to do that. And you can do that in a small country to some extent, with quite a good agricultural sector. The second thing we've got to do, you know, we have a, quite a high debt uh, overhang, 80% or so debt to GDP ratio uh, through a combination of graduation away from uh, cheap money from development banks and others um, and uh, becoming an upper middle income country plus increasing the private capital market borrowing. Uh, so we've got to stabilize that part of it and find the revenue to meet the payments. And we've not defaulted historically and, and there's no particular issue on that, but we just have to make the payments and then release resources to pay for the welfare and so on and the investment program that's needed uh, and the stimulus package, which is very critical. And the third bit, I think, is we've got to become the most competitive environment in, in, in South Asia. Um, small economy, uh, improve our doing business rankings, I would say, to 60 or so, uh, down from 90 odd. Uh, and that means really, uh, you know, slashing uh, all the red tape there is, uh, you know, and digitizing all public services rather quickly, um, as well as ensuring issues like the land ownership issue and leasing, which have been a problem. Uh, we should have very strong anti-corruption measures, uh, et cetera, and, and really make this a very attractive place to do business. And then I think because it's a small country and we've proved public health wise that we've managed to tackle at least the first wave of the COVID, we can have a branding as a biosecure place, which I think will help us because this pandemic is there for the foreseeable future. I think we had the WHO chief scientist telling us we're going to live with COVID for many years to come even if there is a vaccine, because there are politics of a vaccine uh, and, you know, who will get it and when it will be there and all of that. So, you know, I think Sri Lanka, by definition, has that advantage of being small and nimble and we have to capitalize and time will tell whether we do it well. Thank you, Salim. Uh, Salim, both, uh, you know, I end this conversation from my side. Uh, Sitara will uh, follow me. But I think I, I can't help but ending this on a somewhat, uh, you know, sad note because I was just <clears throat> glancing through the projections and the forecasts that are available with us. And what I notice is that, again, going back to what the World Bank has shared with us, had the pandemic not hit the region, the region would have actually had one of its best growth years as 2020. It would have probably grown at around 6.5%. A great pity, but I think as South Asianists, we believe in one single common factor, the resilience of the region to turn back. So let's hope we will have enough resilience to put this crisis back behind us. And it's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I personally would like to thank both you, Ganesh, and you, Salim. Wonderful to have shared your insights. Thank you to all the participants. Let me hand this back to my colleague, Sitara Doriasan. Thank you, Dr. Palit. And once again, on behalf of the Institute, a very big thanks to Professor Raihan, Dr. Vigna Raja, and, and to our own colleague, Dr. Palit, for such an interesting and insightful session. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing all of you again in the next webinar. Thank you, participants, too. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.